yeah, of course I know her. Everyone thinks she's so interesting. She just has too much style. She just has too much everything. My troppo. She's a pleasure. My troppo. She's a pleasure. She's a pleasure. She's too funny. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Thank you very much for joining us. I just want to clap every time I see that video. I just love that beautiful Bulgari video. Thank you for being here. Welcome to Sotheby's. I'm thrilled today to, um, to moderate a discussion with some wonderful panelists about one of the most important art movements of all time, the Baroque. So what brings us together today are some important pieces, particularly a wonderful Bernini sculpture that we'll be talking about from the collection of Hester Diamond on offer this week at Sotheby's. The sale will be at the end of the week on the 29th, and we do have a public viewing of this beautiful collection um, every day until five o'clock by appointment only. And I have some wonderful panelists. Um, in particular, thank you to Bulgari for joining us in presenting this discussion today. And um, we'll be looking at a new high jewelry collection there. So lots of great things to talk about today. Thank you for joining us to talk about the Baroque. So first I wanna welcome from Rome, Lucia Silvestri. Lucia is the creative director for Bulgari, the legendary house of Bulgari, one of the most important jewelry houses of all time, and um, really defines Italian style and Roman style as well. Lucia has been with Bulgari for 40 years, began her career as a gemstone, a gem acquisition, and she has now finds herself in the wonderful role of creative director. So thank you very much for joining us, Lucia. We're thrilled to highlight today your new high jewelry collection, Baracco, and uh, I can't wait to get more more in depth with you to talk about the Baracco collection, in particular, the wonderful Caravaggio Rosso necklace that you designed um, of rubies and diamonds. And um, we'll talk with you more about that later, but thank you very much for joining us and thanks to Bulgari for, um, for partnering with, with us today. Next, we have Andrew Graham Dixon joining us from England, East Sussex to be exact. Thank you very much for joining us, sir. Uh, Andrew is one of the world's leading art critics and presenters of arts television in the English speaking world. He has presented presented numerous landmark series on art for the BBC and other independents, and he's written several books, including Caravaggio, A Life Sacred and Profane. Um, Andrew also has a long history of public service in the field of art and visual arts, and has served on various com committees, including the prestigious Government Art Committee, um, on which he's, he currently sits. So thank you, Andrew. We look forward to um, hearing your thoughts on the Baroque as well. And finally, my friend and colleague here at Sotheby's, Margaret Schwartz. We like to call her Margie, but I think it's it's a little nice to introduce you formally as Margaret. So thank you for being here. Margie is co-worldwide head of European sculpture and works of art and has been with Sotheby's since 1986. She personally handled the record-breaking sales for individual sculptures, including a Florentine polychrome terracotta group of the Madonna and Child by Donatello that achieved $5.6 million, which was a world record for a Renaissance sculpture. Um, she was also, a friend of Hester Diamond's and worked very closely with her on her collection and spent lots of time enjoying their shared love of sculpture. So Margie, um, it's great to have you here today as well. And what a magnificent um, collection we have with fearless um, Hester Diamond. So uh, I just wanted to point out that the real genesis of this conversation came from the Bernini, the wonderful Bernini sculpture that is part of the Hester Diamond collection and also the Bulgari collection of Baracco. So we just, um, we love the influence of the Baroque. We can't wait to hear more about it. And uh, I think we're, we're just gonna have a great conversation. And then at the end, please do feel free to ask questions. There's a little question box at the bottom. So we'll take some questions and answers at the end. So let's just start. I have to go right to you, Margie, first and just say, uh, let's talk about um, the, the Baroque uh, and in particular Hester Diamond's wonderful collection that you really have been working with for many years. Yeah, several of my colleagues are quite close, um, work like close to Hester, um, and I think everybody in the art world wanted to spend time with her. She was bold and warm and smart and really was fearless. Um, we were trying to come up with the right word for her, and I think that that says it all. Um, she loved art. She was curious all the time, searching for um, more information on anything and everything. And if some of you have looked online and have seen some of our videos about Hester and her life, 
she uh, came from very little in the Bronx and started collecting modern art after dealing a bit in the 60s and 70s with her husband. Incredible pieces from like Picasso's and Mondrian's and Kandinsky's and a Brancusi bird. At a certain point in the later 80s, she decided that her walls were just valued too high. She needed to sell them. Um, and she wanted to switch to another area. She started to love um, Impressionist, uh, excuse me, old master paintings. Um, and she loved the Baroque in particular, but she also loved Northern pieces, Netherlandish pieces from the Renaissance and Italian after that. And she started collecting sculpture like the wonderful Bonazza reliefs of the four winds behind me. Um, but what is so exciting this week for us um, and a little bit sentimental is, is, is offering this wonderful Bernini for sale that Hester purchased from the dealer Anthony Roth in 1991. It was a find by him, which was very mm. exciting. Very few artists are universally considered geniuses. And John Lorenzo was one of them. He was an innovator. And he belonged to an illustrious group of major or the most important protagonists in sculpture in art history, including Donatello, Michelangelo, and then later Canova. So it's really the four of them. And this exceptionally rare marble is a figure of autumn in all of its wonderful, rich abundance. He is about to pluck a fruit from this headdress that he has basically of fruit, um, all different kinds of fruit on his head. And he has a little glint in his eye and looks over to us and engages the, the viewer um, and, and, and brings us in. It, it's an incredible object to look at and to walk around. This was carved between 1615 and 1618 and was likely commissioned by Prince Leone Strozzi who had a villa in Rome on, it was called Villa Al Viminale on the hill. And he was one of Bernini's first major patrons. He came from a Florentine family. What was incredible about his collection is he had a great number of antiquities and he would pair modern, quote unquote, modern pieces, like pieces from the Bernini's with his antiquities. And in fact, some of the inventories from the villa show that this piece was likely paired with two other antiquities and one other modern piece to create four seasons altogether. Um, John Lorenzo Bernini was too young to take on commissions at this time in his life. He was still a teenager when he carved this and he worked in collaboration with his father and you can see some of his father in this, Pietro, in this uh, sculpture altogether. Um, but this is the moment when he was becoming independent from his father. And as you look at the object, you can see sort of the Baroque sprouting um, in his turning and his musculature and his, he's got this wonderful uh, arched back and he's ready to move. We've caught him in a moment. We've frozen him in a moment of movement. And, um, he is now, at this point, John Lorenzo is finding his creative voice. And only after this did he become completely independent because he was of age. And years later, only about four years later, he started carving uh, works for the Borghese family, such as the Apollo and Daphne, which we all know well, among other things that are now in the Borghese gallery. Um, this piece was also, I'll say, as I mentioned earlier, is in mentioned in the villa's inventories, first time in 1652. And it notes there that the piece was placed in a hall, a grand hall on a fancy alabaster base. And that's interesting because almost all of the rest of the pieces in the collection, which was massive, were specifically placed on wooden bases. And this was mentioned in the inventory that this piece was put on an alabaster base. And so I think from a very early time, uh, Prince Strozzi and other people realized how important John Lorenzo was and how important the sculpture is. Been privileged to look at that sculpture every day this week. And um, we worked on a beautiful photo shoot with, with some jewels from Bulgari, but I will see it in a very different way when I go back after um, hearing that beautiful description of it. Thank you. Um, I'd love to hear, Andrew, from you just generally about the Baroque and maybe some of the important works and artists, of course, including Bernini, that really helped give rise to the Baroque? 
For me, you know, you, the 17th century is the great century of the Baroque. Um, and, and if you go back to the beginning of that century, I, I think that's where what turns into the Baroque really begins. And it begins with essentially a kind of a, an argument, quite a hard fought argument. Sometimes the, <laughs> the fighting turns quite dirty um, about what art is going to be going forward. You know, there's been the Counter-Reformation. What, what is the religious artist to do? Is he to uh, continue to emphasize the holy poverty of Christ and his disciples, to emphasize the way of humility? Or, which is the other route, is he to emphasize um, the majesty and the splendor of heaven? Is he to paint the Madonna as the queen of heaven? Or is he to paint her as a poor woman who was the mother of a poor boy who turned out to be the living God? And, and you can see that argument played out right at the beginning, as I say, of the 17th century in um, the wonderful church of Santa Maria del Popolo in, in Rome, where Caravaggio on the one hand and Annibale Caracci on the other hand are simultaneously commissioned by the papal treasurer Tiberio Cirazzi to create for his funerary chapel. Caravaggio gets two paintings and Caracci gets one. Caravaggio is rather annoyed because he doesn't get the altarpiece, he gets the side panels. So you've got this wonderful... Caravaggio painting, which is the conversion of Saul, amazing picture by Caravaggio. But that is really, that's what Baroque will not be. Caravaggio is saying poverty, simplicity, and he, he, he's, he's going it down that route. His, his, his influences are all to do with Franciscanism and that, and that movement towards poverty. Karachi is doing the opposite. He's saying, no, 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 we are going to emphasize the majesty of the Virgin. Karachi makes a big mistake in this fight because he actually puts his picture up first. Caravaggio arranged his painting, as you can see there, so that the backside of his horse is in the face of Karachi's upwardly ascending Madonna. But ultimately, although Caravaggio, I would say that that's round one. So Caravaggio wins it, holy poverty wins it. But in the long game, Karachi and, and the followers of the Baroque, this, the creators of this new style, which is all about majesty and it's about power. And it's partly, partly also, it's, it's, it thrives partly in Rome because the, the authorities there are actually rather frightened of the common people. You know, there's this fear that they might rise up. So do we want an art like Caravaggio's, which says that the meek shall inherit the earth, follow poverty, follow that way, and you will go to God? No, we want an art that keeps them in their place. And, and that art is the Baroque with its magnificence, its theatricality, its emphasis on hierarchy and order. It places you, it places you in a huge space and makes you feel quite small. Whereas Caravaggio's paintings make you feel, well, you're part of the scene. The Baroque doesn't want that. It doesn't want that. It's all about splendor. And it becomes more and more and more extravagant and theatrical. And that's where Benini comes in because he is the... If you want theatre, if you want extravagance, if you want ingenuity, if you want marvels, you know, that's what he will give you. The Autumn isn't, of course, a religious work of art, but it's got so many of the, of, of the qualities that we'll find in the Baroque, this, this sense of theatre, which is not a solemn theatre. It's an extravagant, exuberant theatre. It, it, it's all about, you know, Autumn's a great subject for Bernini because Autumn is the season of getting the fruits. It's the season of La Cornucopia. Uh, you know, and Baroque is all about the cornucopia. The Baroque is all about my troppo. So if you had to choose, you know, to, to give a few buzzwords or what, like what characteristics or what single words would you say really characterize the, the Baroque? And that's for anyone, Margie, Lucia, Andrew, who, what, what do you, what would you, how would you narrow it down? I would say restlessness, exploding, flying, floating, I mean, all of these sort of active words, um, yeah. splendor, grandeur, color. There's nothing left for the rest of you. <laughs> Sprezzatura. Sprezzatura, that sort of effortless flourish, um, illusion, making you feel, it's almost like, it's not like cinema, it's bigger than cinema. It's like, it's like 3D cinema. <laughs> um, uh, it's, yeah, it's wealth, it's power, 
um, its beauty, its ingenuity. Yeah, you, you told everything, but it's power, it's light, colors, uh, so all uh, positive meanings, uh, daring, daring so also, and also, I have to say, rock, in some way also a revolutionary and rock. <laughs> Excellent. Color, um, color is important. If I can just chip in, color is very, color is very important because if you think about Caravaggio, he uses very few colors. He has a very bright, bold red, but apart yeah. from that, he hardly ever uses blue. Why does he never use blue? Because blue is the color of money. And in that time, people looked at a painting, and if they saw a lot of blue, they saw, oh, that's an expensive painting. Caravaggio wanted people to think, no, it's not an expensive painting, it's a cheap painting, because expensive paintings, that could get the church into trouble. They spent too much money, they should spend their money on the poor, and all that. Whereas the Baroque artist doesn't need to think about that. The church says, no, just go for it. Color, gold, you name it. Exactly. I love it. Um, Margie, I want to talk specifically about the Bernini and, and Hester as a collector. I mean, first of all, I can't imagine what it must be like to live with, with such a thing in your home, right? It's one thing to walk around Rome or to go to the galleries and see sculptures like this, but to own a piece like this. And then because you knew her so well, it sounds like she amassed an early collection that she then sold and, and started from scratch with old masters. That's a lot of... Um, there's a lot of thought that goes into a collection like that. It's not just buying things. So tell us a little bit about her, the lady. Well, like Bernini, Hester was audacious and timeless and curious, which just made her so much fun um, to, to be with when we happen to be abroad at the same time or just to talk to about art. From what I'm told from her children, um, one of the pieces that she had was the Brancusi bird in air that's now at the Seattle Art Museum, an unbelievable sculpture. And that had a prominent place in the collection. It sort of was the anchor to the entire grand um, modern collection. And at one point, as I told you, um, she felt she couldn't hold on to these pieces anymore and was really curious about a completely different area um, old master paintings and this she found the Bernini and that ended up being the anchor to the collection the totem for this new old master sculpture and paintings collection um, and she lived with everything nothing was precious uh, in terms of not being able to touch it for, for Hester her kids were running around all over the place things might have been spilled on a piece of furniture Obviously, the kids were, were, were not doing that constantly, but she wanted people to enjoy the pieces. She wanted people to sit on her wonderful furniture and be comfortable. You can see the splendid colors in there. And so many of the old master paintings, even the darker ones, worked so well on these uh, yellow walls and with this brightly colored furniture. It's sort of having that furniture and that surrounding kicked out these wonderful subtle colors in the paintings and indeed in some of the polychromy on the sculptures. She also had, as you will see, some rocks, <laughs> some minerals, um, a, actually a wonderful collection of minerals, which were selling in the online sale on Friday afternoon uh, of this week, which are tremendous. And, and I, hadn't known, I didn't know she's been collecting these, but I think she loved the natural forms and they are absolutely sculpture in themselves. And in fact, there are a number of sculpture collectors now that I have found out that are collecting minerals, which I think is 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 very interesting. You can yeah, there, she really has she has some amazing examples in that collection. They really are um, some of the largest and most beautifully formed. The colors, you know, every color and the pyrites in particular are truly just beautiful, beautiful objects to look at. True natural wonders, and it's such an interesting mix for her with mm -hmm. um, with the other things that she collected. I love that. It was always juxtaposition. I mean, that's the word we use a lot when talking about the collection, but it's juxtaposing sometimes modern pieces, sometimes English furniture, old masters with contemporary uh, furniture and yeah. sculpture. And it's just somehow it worked. Now, Hester was a designer in her early days, so she had that bug. Um, but for me, her collection is a study in Baroque. Even though not every pick, piece is Baroque, it's a study in emotion. It's a study in drapery styles, in rhythm. Uh, and it, it's interesting to look at the collection as a whole, like 
with you, um, how the pieces react to one another and speak to one another. Yeah, and, and the way the way you all have designed the exhibition is really masterful because you totally, without going to her apartment, you get a sense of that mix and the, the eclecticism. And I think anyone who's in New York should come over the next three days and try and see um, see the collection um, by appointment, of course. Uh, I would love to know, Baroque, where the term came from, because I know in my world, in jewelry, for instance, we talk about art deco jewelry or 2D fruity jewelry. Those names were not used at the time that the jewels were created. We we made up those names later. What about Baroque? What, what, they weren't referring to their work as such in, 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 at the time, were they? No, they weren't. No, no. They um, the, the term, I, I believe the term Baroque um, actually comes from two things. It comes from a word meaning bizarre, and it also comes from a word meaning irregularly shaped pearl of the kind that you see in some settings of Baroque. Um, well, not only jewellery, but particularly tableware, elaborate um, things that you would put on the, on, on the table to dress it for dinner. Um, they use these pearls, so you'd have an amazing object that looks like a camel, but it's actually the body of the camel is shaped by an irregular pearl. Um, but I, I believe it's it, it's it's really applied after the fact, and and it, it like a lot of art style names, it, it's kind of an insult. <laughs> you know, like cubism was an insult. It's all cubistic. It wasn't invented by Picasso and Braque, and it was invented after the fact. So Bernini would never have said to anybody, you know, I am the master of the Baroque. Uh, <laughs> he he didn't know he was. That's excellent. Um, so continuing the discussion of the name, Lucia, I would love to know more about your new high jewelry collection, Morocco, and how you decided to name it such, um, first just about the name, and then the inspiration for the collection in general. So, you know, uh, the, we, are, we live in Rome. Our company is from Rome. I was born in Rome, so we feel uh, the city and the, the Baroque city. So uh, we feel very, very close with the Baroque art because uh, uh, we have the same kind of uh, feeling, like uh, uh, bearing, uh, density, colors, uh, light. And I felt at the beginning, when we started to create the collection, I felt uh, um, a natural way to create a, a jewelry, a collection around this world. And uh, my first uh, inspiration, of course, uh, Rome is my first uh, source of inspiration. Mm -hmm. And my first step for this collection is uh, starting in, um, in Piazza Navona uh, in, uh, in August uh, 2019, so one year before the launch of the collection. And uh, in Piazza Navona, early morning, nobody around me. Uh, I started to walk around uh, the, the square, uh, to, uh, to, to, to in pictures and videos, and I felt so uh, close to the Baroque uh, elements and art that I, I, I thought that was uh, not easy, but natural to create something around this uh, art, this moment. Absolutely beautiful. I, I just have to show this piece because this is the one, if I can get this correctly, how do I do this? Um, this is a masterpiece. We are thrilled to have this on exhibition and offering it for private sale here at Sotheby's. And uh, this is a, a new piece from the collection. And I would just love to hear um, a little bit about the design itself and also the incredible construction of this necklace. You know, we were talking earlier that this piece can be removed and worn by itself. So you can have a single row or you can just wear this part by itself or all together. And it's just it's just absolutely gorgeous. And the stones are beautiful. I just love to hear more about the, the actual building of this particular necklace. Of course, uh, we started, I personally started from the ruby. Uh, the ruby is a 10 carat uh, Mozambique ruby. And I, I was bought the rubies one year before the collection. Uh, so when I, when I bought the, the ruby, I saw the beautiful color, the, the brilliancy, the, the vivid color inside of the stone. The cut was not perfect, but I could see uh, the potentiality of the gem. And, uh, you know, when, when I buy a gem, I have to feel it. So I have to feel uh, not only uh, the color, the clarity and the cut, but also the, uh, 
a kind of energy inside of the jam. So I bought a stone and I decided to recut a little bit uh, here in Rome uh, with a mustard cut of stones and uh, we could have the perfect cut, the perfect cushion cut in this 10 carats ruby. This is a Mozambique ruby and when I, I saw the final color here in Rome with the fire inside of the, the ruby, there is a, really a fire, a uh, perfect cut, perfect color, uh, saturation, everything was perfect. I, I thought immediately to Caravaggio, uh, Rosso Caravaggio, red from Caravaggio, and I talked with um, the designer, and because of course it is a teamwork, so I talked, I, I talked with the designer and I said that I'd like to have something special uh, with movement, with the brilliancy, with design around this gem. And uh, we created this necklace and it took something like uh, more than 1,500 hours to, to make this necklace. It's very complicated. Uh, there is a hidden mechanism. So you can wear uh, the necklace in three ways, uh, like you, you said before. Uh, one, a simple string, and two together, or three together. And um, it's something that uh, is very sophisticated in, term of, uh, in terms of design and uh, craftsmanship. And uh, there is a, a, master, is a masterpiece with a, with a gem that is a superlative. Yeah, no, it's it's really a masterpiece, I have to say. Just to be able to handle this, to look at both front and back, the way it's constructed, and these amazing little um, rubies. From a distance, they almost look like a normal. It's really, it, it's a masterwork. And I can imagine- Did you see the back, yeah, you see yeah. the, back of the necklace? That is so special, so unique. Every detail, so we took care about every detail. Yeah. So, it's yeah, so yeah. very special. Wonderful piece. Well, I can imagine living in Rome, it would be hard hard to not be inspired, just, uh, just walking around your beautiful city. Um, and speaking of Rome, um, Andrew and Margie, what was the art scene like at the time? You know, in terms of like, like how did Rome become the center and what was the sort of the status of artists? Who were their patrons? What was sort of the, you know, the downtown Rome art scene like in the day? Well, I, I had a... Um... I had a tutor when I was studying art history years and years ago, and he said the main th what you want to remember about Rome is Rome in 1600 is like Hollywood in 1950, except there's only really one studio. <laughs> it's the church. It's the Counter-Reformation. It's, it's let's hit back at all these Protestants who've banned images, they've smashed images, they've emptied their churches. We're going to have more churches. We're going to have more art. Sculptors, painters, come, come. So you've got the city that is just teeming. There's a whole artist's quarter, which is incidentally right next to um, the prostitute's quarter, probably not by coincidence, actually. And, and this artist's quarter has got something like 4,000 people in it at a time when the whole population of Rome is only about 100,000, and a lot of those are priests. There are almost no women. There are cardinals, there are bishops, there's the Pope. They're the patrons. And then these people, these artists who've come from everywhere to make it in Hollywood, I mean, Rome. Um, th that's, that's the situation. And so if you follow the life of Caravaggio, you know, his desperate effort to get into the house of a cardinal. He gets his cardinal. He gets interested. Cardinal Del Monte buys a painting. The minute he buys that painting, Caravaggio's got his foot on the ladder, the first rung of the ladder. And then he gets more commissions. Then he gets the, the commission in, in the great church of the French, all through the cardinal's influence. So that's how it works. And, and, and that's who they're painting for. Essentially, it's the cardinals. Even if it's in a church, it's usually yeah. for the chapel of someone who wants, you know, there's usually a stipulation in the painter's contract. Once you've painted this picture, you know, we will pay um, and we will also pay X amount of money so that mass will always be said in that chapel, you know, in our memory after we're dead. So, so that, that's what it's all about. It's about salvation. Fantastic. That's how you save your soul. If you've got lots of money, the only way to save your soul is you spend it, spend it on art and the art goes in the church. Right. Sound, sounds like a good plan actually. Um, 
I'd love to hear every everyone's favorite favorite architectural monument um to the Baroque in Rome. Like Lucia, what's your favorite? If you had to pick one. Um I love the square. I love uh, Piazza Navona. It's uh, really my favorite square in the world. I think that it's, it's my trop of bellezza, never too much of beauty. It's uh, at every corner there is uh, something that uh, uh, suggests me um, something to create for, for the jewelry. And uh, it's uh, so special, the fountains uh, from Lorenzo Bellini and the uh, Paul Rivers fountains. It's so, it looks like a talking, a talking to us. So it's something very simulated for my, my inspiration. Beautiful. And are, do, you, do you get to visit it often? Do you see it? How often do you pass by? Uh, not really often, but during the lockdown, I really, I have to say that I, I walk a lot around uh, Rome and in Rome, in the center of Rome. And I discover also places that I I never saw before. So and especially I could see without people. Can you imagine Rome, the beauty of Rome without people? Yeah. It's it's magic, it really magic. It it's uh, unfortunately is uh, the, the reason because of what, uh, is uh, empty is not a good reason of course. Uh, it's a tragedy. But um, but the beauty of Rome it's incredible. I have to say that now more than in the past, I have much more inspiration from Rome. Right. Margie, what's your favorite spot in Rome? Okay, one of them is of them. Maria della Vittoria um, because of the ecstasy of Saint Teresa and the Cornaro Chapel um, built by Bernini, and it's 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 just this perfect building and so rich in color and illusion um he carves the ecstasy of saint Teresa. he carves these clouds these these cloth out of marble and she's floating upward and it's just it's an incredible illusion because this is this is a lot of marble there and these wonderful rays golden rays of sun it's just an amazing place and you feel you feel like it's part of you when you walk in. Bernini has expanded the space by his use of stucco and color and all the rest of it, and you become a part of this space. The other part that I love is that, as, as you all know, the some of the Cornara family and saints um, are in relief, carved in relief on the sides of the chapel, and they're chatting, and they're looking over to see what we are doing, looking at St. Teresa. And I think it's just fascinating that, that bringing in that fourth dimension, as they say, um, that Bernini did. It's just a wonderful spot. Hmm. Beautiful. Um, and Andrew, talk to me just a little bit about specifically theatricality. Like this is a lot of what you've been describing really seems to be just the theater, uh, the elements of theater. Does that, is that something that you, do you talk about or write about when you think about the Baroque? Oh, you, you can't avoid it. I mean, it's, it, <laughs> I talked before about, about this sort of idea of competition. You know, all the artists are competing for the attention of the patrons, but the patrons are competing with each other as well to create the most magnificent, the most spectacular, the most fantastic thing that they possibly can. And, and, and I, I like the fact that um, Lucia mentioned, you know, the fountain, the fountain of Piazza Navona, because of course the fountain is the most perfect occasion for this kind of public theatrical display combined with competition. Because if a Pope wants to make himself popular, he commissions a fountain because a fountain brings water to the people. Rome's a hot place in that they always have a problem with water supply in the Baroque period. So they're reactivating the ancient Roman water supply and they're bringing the water in and then there's this fountain. And it seems like a kind of miracle. And it is the miracle of life to the ordinary people, but Bernini makes it into a kind of sculptural miracle as well. And, and, and as time goes on, you know, this fountain competition, you know, it doesn't just stop with Bernini. So you get the, you get the, then you get the Trevi fountain in which an entire building has been turned into an astonishing, I mean, look, at, is, that, is that a sculpture? Is that a building or is it a theater? I mean, it's all three and it's the miracle of water. It's the miracle of life and it's Anita Ekberg. 
striding in with Marcello Mastroianni shivering in his boxers. I mean, it's, you know, it's so bound up Fellini, of course, you know, why did he choose that? You know, he knew that he had to have the, the, the fountain is, is, the, is the- He had to, he had, what else, what else would he choose? Yes, and fountains do everything that the Baroque does. You know, the, when, a water, when a piece of water goes whoosh into the air, that's water being made Baroque. Can you imagine the, the fountains without people around? Can you imagine that, that, that building without people? It's a, a miracle, <laughs> right? It's, a miracle. Uh, yeah. well, I've, 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 it's very difficult to get it. I mean, I've filmed a lot in Rome, and so we always start filming. The only time you get the Trevi Fountain without people normally is five o'clock in the morning. In the summer, you have to be there. By half past five, there's already eight Japanese people, a few Chinese people, and some other tourists from other parts of the world have already started coming. But at 5 a.m., you just about get it. And it, it, it's kind of amazing, but it's also amazing when it's full, too. Yeah. yeah. Yes, yeah. But it's different to see to see this building, huge building, with the, 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 the fountains, with the water, the, the noise of the water, and uh, without people around. Uh, I, I was really touched, really touched. It's like a theater without the audience. Yeah. Um, Lucia, I know we've all said color. Everybody went to color um, as a characteristic of the Baroque. And I know you started your career in gem acquisition with Bulgari. So gemstones really are at the heart of your inspiration. Tell us a little bit about some of the others besides the ruby, some other, some other important stones in the collection. But for instance, we have a necklace with the five uh, emeralds, emerald cut, and we call uh, the green dream. And uh, it's a necklace with a, this layout is more than 128 carats. The, the perfect shape, the perfect color, uh, matching color. And I have to say the research of these emeralds was very difficult because they're not easy to find a layout like that. And uh, I found, I have to say, I found the stones around the world. So two stones, uh, I founded two stones in uh, Hong Kong, one stone in New York, and the other two stones uh, in Jaipur. So it's a very international necklace. And uh, the idea was to, it's a kind of homage to Elizabeth Taylor. Mm -hmm. uh, she has a beautiful necklace with, uh, with her notes, and I'm sure you know it. And uh, we did this kind of really design with a, a simple, but at the same time, rich and very, very modern, contemporary, but with a touch of a Baroque sign. Great. Well, this brings us, let's, let's go right into some questions from the viewers. I see the first question is going to go right, continue your discussion. They're asking, does your process start with, um, with design or with a gemstone, or does it vary? Uh, we have two kinds of processes. When we work with diamonds, we start from an idea, from a suggestion, and uh, yeah, from pictures, uh, and we talk about the, the suggestion, and, and then we buy the diamonds. When we start from color gems, the process is uh, the opposite. We start from the gem. So the gem, uh, like in the, the, Caravaggio, the Caravaggio necklace, we start to think about the idea of the necklace around the gem. So again, there we have two processes. Great. Um, the next question, I think I'm going to ask Andrew, particularly I'm going to ask you about architecture. Do you see any um, Baroque influences in contemporary architecture that you would point to? Um, you know, you, you feel like there's this lasting influence over the centuries, but I, I can't, I personally can't think of one, so I'd love to know if you can. <laughs> well, I think it's difficult to say. I mean, I think, I think that one of the, one of the great aspects that, of Baroque architecture, one of its prime characteristics is to create buildings that you think it comes from mannerism, you know, the, the, the buildings, for example, like the Palazzo del Te, where you have entablatures that look, he deliberately made it look as if pieces are missing. So you wonder how the building is standing up. So I think, oh, for example, the great dome of the Holy Shroud by Guarini in Turin, which is amazing, but you think, how can it be as tall as it? And then you realize it isn't as tall as it is. It's fooling you, it's fooling the eye. Um, now, in terms of modern architecture, that kind of uh, ability to 
cheat apparent logic has been made much easier to achieve by the advent of computer programs for architecture. So that an architect can design something and a computer can work out all the stresses in the materials that enables it to be built. So in a sense, you know, when you look at something like Zaha Hadid or, or even some of Frank Gehry's work, which, which has slightly got the imprint of that computer design on it as well, they're able to do things that are essentially quite Baroque in my, in my mind. They don't necessarily look Baroque, but that idea of, you know, almost a building that might fall down on you, but it yeah. doesn't. You know, that, that, that idea of surprise, because, because the Baroque artist always wants to surprise and delight, and he always wants to go one further than the guy before or the lady before, but in the Baroque, it was mostly guys. But, you know, um, so that idea of going going one beyond, um, and you see it a lot perhaps in, I suppose the spirit of Baroque, you see in, in high rise city competition, you know, one guy makes a tall building, another guy makes an even taller building. That to me is very Baroque. Yeah. Or, you know, you get this and then you get the gherkin. So it's not only very tall, but it looks weird. That, yeah. that so the Birkin could almost be, and, and, and the other thing that's quite Baroque about that is, is what's very Baroque is that you can have a Baroque object and it could be a jewel, it could be something really small that you could wear, or it could be a building, but it's the same thing. You yeah. know, it can change, it can change. It's, and that's, that also seems to me something that's true about things like the Gherkin. You could imagine it almost as a paperweight, but no, it's a building. So I think there are things like that. Uh, uh, and, uh, and as I say, that spirit of competition or the expression of power and money. So you tend to get it very much in, in say, you know, the skyline of Chicago. You don't tend to get it in poorer areas of town because, you know, the money isn't there to be to be flaunted. But it's, yeah. it's that. Wow, makes perfect sense. Margie, let's talk a little bit again about the Bernini and, um, and the Hester Diamond. I mean, obviously, this is such an important piece. Um, the estimate, I think, is 8 to 12 million. Is that right? So I'll say it, that seems pretty low to me. I don't know. I wouldn't think you could acquire something like that at that price. Um, not that I'm bidding, but someone will. But where does she have it in her house? And how, like, how does she live with it? I gather she moved it a little bit, but it ended up in the living room, uh, or rather the dining room, with um, this marvelous next to this marvelous uh, rainbow tree that's also in the um, exhibition and the sale um, by Chinese uh, artists. And as I said before, nothing was really precious. So you could go up to it. It was sort of um, subtly lit in, in the corner so you could enjoy it while you were eating dinner. I mean, it was just, it was beautiful. <laughs> Great. Um, well, I think that might just wrap it up unless we have any more questions coming in from the viewers. Let's see. I also wanted to say one thing, of course, Please. I forgot that Bernini was also a playwright and a set designer, a stage designer, so and a painter. Um, so he was really the full package of the Baroque. I don't I, I wonder why we don't use the term Baroque man. Um, instead of Renaissance, Renaissance man, because that, that would work. And but it's, no, that, that's very true, Margie. That's, yeah. that's very true. That the, the figure of Autumn um, reminds me of some of the characters drawn by Inigo Jones for the Stuart Court masks, which are the same time as Bernini, these elaborate theatrical entertainments in which people would dress up as the figure of Autumn or mm -hmm. Summer or... The, the king of winter and his cloak would all be white. You know, that awesome figure could almost be, he almost could have walked out of theater, one of those court entertainments into the real world. But another thing that occurs to me from hearing you talk about Hester is, and I'd be interested to know what Lucia thinks about this, is that it strikes me that there's room for people who collect modern to collect old more. I mean, I used to have a friend who collected Francis Bacon and his wife collected amazing furniture. So you had the Francis Bacon triptych with Marie Antoinette's settee in front of it. And it was a kind of amazing juxtaposition. And I was wondering, because it, it seems to me that Italians don't have this problem. Italians grow up with old masters, as it were, because they see them all the time. It surrounds them. So the idea that you would switch from an old master taste to a modern taste W wouldn't make yes. sense in Italian. Yes, it uh, makes sense. It's, for us, it's my trump, you know? <laughs> never too much beauty. So it's, uh, it's true, it's true. We, we live with the beauty, surrounded by beauty. 
Rome, especially, but not only Rome, but Rome is especially a treasure box. It's uh, so rich of uh, beauty. Corisa, for me, there is in Italy, in, in Rome, there is the best museum in the world, in my opinion, that is Galleria Borghese. That's it's amazing. I don't know what do you think about it, but for me, it's, uh, it's the best. Una bellissima collezione. That's also, true. the antiquities. The antiquities in there are unbelievable, let alone the Caravaggio de Bernini. I mean, it's just ma, incredible. Yeah, I, mean, I, want to, I want to be in Rome now. <laughs> we, all, we all want to come visit you in Rome, Lucia. We'll have to, we'll have to get that on the calendar as soon as we can. Yes. Please come, come as soon as possible. Rome, Rome needs uh, you and uh, the new life. Really. Great. Thank you all. This has been this has been really a lot of fun and I can't tell you how much I've learned. I'm going to go walk the galleries immediately after this and um, look at these pieces in a new way. So thank you, Lucia. Thank you, Andrew. Thank, thank you, you. Marty. And um, once again, if anyone is in New York and wants to come see us this week, we're open every day till five for an appointment. You can see the beautiful Bernini, all of the collection, as well as many old other old masters, beautiful works and also this incredible necklace. So um, thank you again, and uh, we look forward to seeing you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks so much. Bye. Bye. Yeah, of course I know her. Everyone thinks she's so interesting. She just has too much style. She just has too much everything. My troppo. She's a pleasure. My troppo. She's a rhythm. She's too funny.